Hello, all. Uh, greetings. Um, welcome to the uh, Great Debate Community Channel. Um, I'm your host tonight, John Peterson. And once again, I am scaring everybody off by showing my face. Uh, let me get that uh, avatar up. Uh, so we are here tonight to talk about uh, next month will be the 30th anniversary of the Berlin Wall coming down. And I'm joined tonight by Dr. Misha Griffith. Welcome, Misha. Good evening. Thank you for having me, John. And uh, we had some other, uh, another panelist that was going to join us, but they had to cancel at the last moment. Nick Suter, as you may, might have seen in the, the, the video description. And all week long, uh, you know, uh, Per uh, Misha's suggestion, I did try and get a hold of uh, 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 somebody from Germany to get a German perspective on all of this. And uh, being as that they are, I believe it's six hours ahead of us, uh, it was a little late for them uh, to yeah. be joining us. So it's just going to be me and Misha tonight. Um, please, uh, you know, if you have uh, questions for Misha, please feel free to uh, tag the great debate community in the live chat and we will try and get it get to any questions that you have. Um, there's already one question in the live chat that we'll get to once we get to that uh, uh, portion of the program. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, so the Berlin Wall uh, was built um, in 1961. Right. Uh, it was it had been it had been a uh, somewhat fortified area. It had been something of a wall, but it was pretty permeable. Uh, starting in the uh, early morning of August 18th, 8, 1961, uh, they started constructing a five foot cement wall with barbed wire on top. Over the years, it turned into a 12-foot high wall, cement wall, with a special covering over the top. Uh, and on the East German side, there was a no man's land, uh, supposedly had some landmines in it, definitely was cleared of all vegeta vegetation except for grass and gravel so they could see footprints in it. And it was guarded 24 hours a day with spotlights and the guards who were uh, who were assigned there were trained to shoot on sight if anyone passed a, passed a certain a certain barrier. Wow. Um, and now, uh, could you uh, take as long as you want to start us out and talk about uh, the things that led up to the building of the wall? Um, I know that in some of the research I did um, that. Uh, the people that built the wall uh, claim it, that in part that it was for economic reasons, but I think there's, I, I, I would, I would think there's much more to it than that. There was the official story out of the GDR out of East Germany. There were unofficial stories and there were stories out of West Germany. Berlin was a trouble spot from the end of World War II, because as you know, the allies, the United States, Great Britain, France, and the Soviet Union uh, in 1945, divided up Germany into East Germany and West Germany, and they divided up Berlin in half, West Berlin and East Berlin. But it was actually divided up into four parts. The, the United States had a portion, Great Britain had a portion, France had a portion, and the Soviet Union had a portion. East Berlin was the Soviet Union portion. West Berlin was, of course, the other three allies, but uh, it was this sea of the Federation of the, the German Republic right in the middle of the German Democratic Dem uh, Dem <laughs> Democratic Republic, a euphemism that can't even come out of my mouth anymore. Um, <laughs> so, so in we had an issues in 1948 when Stalin's still around and he decided to starve the West Germans out. 
and that was when he shut down the rail the rail line between West Germany and West Berlin. You could physically get on a train in West Berlin and you would be uh, sealed in that train and you would go all the way across East Germany, pretty much most of the way across East Germany, and then only let out when you got to West Germany. But that train would be searched on both sides of the border. Um, when Stalin stopped the train delivery, he stopped the delivery of all food to West Berlin. And the idea was he was going to starve the West Berliners out. Uh, we got around that by the Berlin airdrop, which was the most magnificently planned uh, um, drop of food. At the moment, people did not think you could feed an entire city that large by the air. They thought it had to be uh, uh, by truck or by railroad. And we were taking bombers off and landing them at Teppelhof Air Force Base, and then another plane would take off every 45 seconds. It wasn't the same plane. There were so many planes in the air because it was just after World War II that we had all these bombers. So we had the manpower, we had the planes, we had the ground crews all there, and we fed a East Berlin for a, a, almost a year before Stalin finally said, okay, obviously uh, they're not going to give up. And we weren't, we, we would never have given up, I don't think. Uh, this was also part of the story of the candy bombers. Some of the pilots would in fact uh, notice that there were kids, West German kids who were waiting for the bombers to land because they know that was food. And they'd tie up Hershey bars and make take their, uh, take their handkerchiefs and turn them into parachutes and toss these out the window as they were coming in to land. And then it would parachute down on the kids and the kids called them the candy bombers. Um, <laughs> and, and I have actually met Germans who remember getting care packages from the United States and saying um, it was, it astounded them that the United States who had been their enemy during World War II was willing to feed them. Meanwhile, the Soviet Union had packed up entire factories from Germany and moved them across into the Soviet Union. So that was a, there was a huge difference in how things were being handled. But what led up to the wall was uh, number one, a brain drain. Uh, anyone with skills tried to get out of East Berlin and East Germany in general. So that was one problem. East Germany was also, at, by June of 1961, almost about to have a famine. They were really close, close enough that they had to announce, hey, we don't have food. Um, and you would not have heard that out of most of the other Soviet satellite nations, but that's how desperate they were. When they, the Soviet Union, took over East Germany and the allies took over West Germany. There was a problem. Where did all the Nazis go? We of course had the Berlin trials. We uh, uh, tried a handful of Nazis and, um, and hung a few, uh, imprisoned many. And the idea was we have taken taken care of Nazism in West Germany. But to the East Germans, they told a different story. The East Germans claimed that all the Nazis were afraid of the incoming Red Army and the communists that were gonna take over, so they all escaped to the West. So West Germany and West Berlin was full of Nazis and fascists. And that's what the uh, Ulbricht, Walter Ulbricht, the head of the Communist Party, in East Germany said, those are the people we have to keep out because they're going to invade, the official term is revanchism. Um, they're gonna invade, so we have to build a wall. So East Germany uh, basically justified the wall by saying, we're afraid the, the Nazis are coming back because West Germany is full of Nazis. So um, that's how they justified it. But really it was to keep the brains in East Germany and East 
Berlin because they were losing doctors, they were losing academics, they were losing a lot of people, and they wanted it stopped. And, and they, I'm sorry. Well, no, I was just going to ask. So the uh, excuse about the Nazis was that like an ad hoc uh, rationalization after That's, the fact of the law being put up? No, that was that was a stated problem since uh, the GDR had been um, had been formed, that they were there as a bulwark against those Nazis that all went to West Germany. And a question from the live chat that seems to fit into what we're talking oh. about now, uh, Mind Onion wants to know, what was uh, Stalin's motivation uh, in trying to starve out West Berlin? Does it go back to what you were just talking about? Simply, simply to reabsorb West Berlin into East Germany. Um, if you look at a map, East Germany had Berlin in the middle of it. So there's quite a bit of land between West Berlin and West Germany. And Berlin was divided in half. And uh, Stalin wanted the allies, Britain, France, and America, out of West Berlin. He wanted the whole city. That was why he decided to starve them out. And when, uh, as you put it a few moments ago, um, when Stalin finally gave up and you know uh, saw that uh, that they were being fed and decided, well, we're not going to be able to stop these folks. Yeah. Did it? Did the uh, infrastructure and everything to uh, supply uh, West Germany was was that something that happened right away, or you know how how, um, how did that come about? They were able to go back and use the railroad once again. Stalin allowed them to use the tracks from West Berlin to West Germany once again. Uh, so we kept flying materials in, not with the uh, urgency that we had done during the the uh, airlift, the Berlin airlift. Hmm. So um, they build the wall. Um, right. They, uh, and, and the wall, as I said, the wall went through quite a few different changes remodels. And as I said, on the East German side, uh, there was a giant uh, no man's land, the entire length of the wall. There was a um, uh, uh, the, the apartments facing the wall on the East Berlin side were all bricked up. I mean, they literally had people throwing themselves out of the apartments to get over the wall um, and digging under the wall. And at one point, there was a family that built balloons, hot air balloons. They were leaving actually East, East Germany, not East Berlin. But people were desperate to get out. And on the West German side, the, the mayor, the mayor of the, of the town, his name was Willy Brandt. He would later become chancellor of Germany. They didn't have any guards there. They didn't have, you know, they had they had some military keeping an eye on it, which is why on one side of the wall it was entirely covered with spray paint and graffiti. Um, it was it was really wild. And when you see pictures of it, it's like, oh my gosh, that that looks like a ghetto wall. But it was the Berlin Wall. Well, and and the thumbnail I had for the broadcast shows a section of that uh, that graffiti. Yeah. Uh, on the yeah. wall. Yeah, you, you, you could you could still see it when the parts of the wall came down. Um, people were breaking it up and selling them or giving them away as souvenirs. But it basically was anyone could take a piece of cement and spray paint it on one side and say, hey, piece of the Berlin Wall. Um, if you're in America, there are a handful of pieces of the real pieces of the Berlin Wall. One is at the Wilson Center in Washington, D.C., um, so you can see what it looked like. And it is plain on one side and spray painted on the other. And so, but there's lots of fakes out there then, huh? Since, oh, yeah, since yeah. That It became a cottage industry of creating fake pieces of the wall. So, you know, we didn't have eBay at that time, but people were trying to, to sell uh, pieces of the wall. Right, I mean, and how, how could you even really verify 
you know, <laughs> whether it was a legitimate piece from the wall, you know, I mean, yeah, talking about concrete. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so it's built in 61, uh, 28 years later, it comes down. Um, now, when I uh, did some research, I found some conflicting information. You know, you mentioned how if people tried to cross the wall, they were to shoot on sight. And I saw a couple of different figures as to how many people actually lost their lives trying to get over the wall. Um, do you, you know, do you have any information on that? Like, like oh, I saw. I, I know there were a lot. I know there were hundreds uh, who were shot. I don't know. I, I don't know off the top of my head how many. If people are, are interested, there is a spectacular website from the Roy Rosenzweig Center for History and New Media at George Mason University. Uh, it's called The Making of the History of 1989. And it is m meant for teachers and meant for people who want to learn about it. Uh, it covers all of the different Soviet satellites and the Soviet uh, Union itself. And it's full of primary, primary sources, images, stories, interviews with historians. Um, and it was put together by my advisor, T. Mills Kelly, who is now the head of the Roy Rosenzweig Center for History and New Media, a fantastic historian, a man who I admire greatly. Um, but definitely it's a good site to go to. In fact, hopefully if we can shoot, uh, do some screen sharing, I can show you a few things from it, but it's, it's a really good site. Is that something you want to do now or do you want to? Uh, not yet, not yet, because, because I, want to, I want to tell a little bit about the story of 1989. Okay. Because 1989 was, was a year of miracles. Basically, that's what historians uh, call it, the year of miracles. Uh, and it wasn't just East Germany and West Germany. It wasn't just uh, what was happening in Europe. Uh, if you recall, uh, 1989, June of 1989, was Tiananmen Square. That was happening in 1989. The Loma Prieta earthquake was 1989. The uh, movements all over Eastern Europe were happening throughout 1989. I didn't see that comment. Not of 1989. Oh, it was, me. Landon Ve uh, Webe says his uh, Oma and Opa fled East Germany the night of 1952 and made their way on ship to Canada. Yeah. I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I just was oh, putting that great. up for everybody else's benefit. But, uh, um, I, I've, I've spent uh, many years collecting these kind of stories, oral histories. So I just love, I just love seeing, seeing those kind of stories. Thank you very much for sharing that. Um, but that year starts out in January, January 19th, 1989, basically when a playwright by the name of Václav Havel goes to lay flowers at a site where a young man named Jak Jan Polak burned himself to death uh, in 1969, January 19th, 1969. And the authorities in Czechoslovakia had uh, absolutely forbidden anyone to memorialize this young man. And Havel ignored the orders and was arrested for that. And that starts a slow build to a to the year in Czechoslovakia in which they're protesting um, the government and their hard-nosed stand. So that's Czechoslovakia, things start happening in January. In February and on, in Poland, solidarity had been happening for years. They had been, led by Lech Walesa, had been trying to change the government, trying to get independent uh, trade unions. That was what he was fighting for. Uh, if you were under the Soviet system, everybody was in a single, tr single union. Uh, all writers were in a writer's union, all radio broadcast engineers were in a radio broadcast engineer union. So you couldn't, um, you, you couldn't negotiate at all 
for any sort of labor movements. So the protests are happening in Poland, which will eventually lead to the an election in June of 1989, uh, where an entire ballot of non-communists are elected. And this portion of Polish history is called the round table moment in which um, non-communists are elected and they come in and they try to reform the government. Meanwhile, in Hungary, you have the, uh, gov the Soviet government there decides to rebury one of the heroes of 1956. And in doing so, the people are trying to rebury him, but uh, the government wants to get on in on this observation, as well as Hungary had uh, been reforming their government very slowly and at some point during this year had cut the barbed wire that uh, was between Hungary and Austria. And this is going to start people, the slow trickle of people leaving Hungary and heading towards Austria. Um, let's see now. And in East Germany, they're having ongoing protests, mainly uh, because they are trying to protest things like better environmental causes. Uh, Chernobyl had only been a few years before that, and that was leading into a true green movement, an anti-nuclear movement in places like East Germany, uh, Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania, they all had protest movements. And the most important thing to understand about all of these protest movements was that they were bottom up. They were the people in the streets saying no more. And, and this is crucial to understanding that year. It was not, as some people would like to say, uh, Ronald Reagan with Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. He had said that in 19, what, 87? He wasn't even in office in 89. He had been out of office. It was George H.W. Bush um, who was keeping track of what was happening in East Germany. But remember, George H.W. Bush was the ambassador to China at one point. He's not looking to Europe. He is looking at China. He is looking at Tiananmen Square. He is trying to figure out what's happening over there. So in many ways, America and our, um, our various intelligence agencies kind of start missing what's going on in East Germany and Latvia and Estonia and Lithuania. And there, this just slow crumbling is starting to happen. By the summer of 89, there will be some relaxation of, um, of travel visas for people in East Germany. And they find that they can get to Prague. And then they start seeking asylum in the American uh, embassy in Prague so that they could you know, try to get uh, asylum, try to come to the United States. Well, they're packing the embassy. The embassy is a very large building, and it's got a beautiful uh, uh, apple orchard and plum orchard out in the back. It's got a little hill with a gazebo on it, little American flag flying. It's a, it's a lovely place. Um, but it started filling up with East Germans. And the American ambassador is saying, wait a minute, you know, we can't do this. And so that's starting to get people's, people's attention. But the wall comes down because of something very, very strange. The world is putting pressure on a, the brand new uh, party leader, Egon Krantz in East, East, East Germany. He had only been in the job for a few months. He decides that what was needed was to relax some of the rules open open things up just a little bit. And he had seen that in the case of Poland, um, when the Polish had elections, they were peaceful, things were happening there, reforms were happening, 
And Gorbachev had parked tanks at the border, but they never came in. And this is what the Napoleon's question about Gorbachev. Um, Egon Krantz, the Communist Party leader in Eastern Germany, sees that there is um, there seems to be a message uh, from from Gorbachev that says he's going to try to pursue perestroika and glasnost. This is the two key words that he had been trying to do to reform the Soviet Union. Uh, so Krantz issues orders to allow movement between East Germany and West Germany. Um, a few people at a time and to, to open it up a little bit, relieve some of the pressure that's happening with the protests. And so there will be a com press conference on November 9th of 1989. And the Communist uh, Party spokesperson, Gunter Schabowski, uh, will be reading at this press conference the new rules. And there is literally video of him reading the new rules and saying, um, you know, this is the new policy. People can go between East Germany and West Germany. And one of the uh, journalist raises his hands, uh, hand and says, uh, when does this go into effect? And the spokesperson looks at the paper and he looks at the back and he looks it up and he looks down and he shrugs his shoulder and says, right now. <laughs> and literally within moments, the, the flood happens. People in East Germany start walking to the wall. And the soldiers don't know what to do. No one knows who's giving orders. It is a madhouse. And this is when uh, November 9th, stuff just happens. They cannot stop it. There are just simply too many people there. And the East German soldiers, a few would be willing to shoot, but most do not seem to be willing to shoot. And that's, and that's the start of the fall of the wall. Um, people start going through it. They're finally seeing their families who they hadn't seen in, in 20 years. Um, and it, it, people are driving their little trabants, trying to make it through, trying to, to get out of East Germany. Uh, and it's a madhouse. But all of a sudden, uh, the rest of Europe and the United States wakes up and says, oh, oh wow. This is really happening because we all thought this division was permanent. We well, all assumed it would be there forever. Well, and as a matter of fact, you know, uh, officials in the uh, in the GDR, uh, there's many quotes out there of them talking about, you know, it'll be still standing in 50 years or it yeah. is a permanent thing, uh, you know. Um, so uh, you say they all, as soon as that that uh, person made that announcement, uh, mm -hmm. that official made that announcement, and they all start rushing to the wall. And of course, uh, it was the people themselves that began to tear it down. When when right. did that start happening? Started very soon after that. Um, that's when all of a sudden you had the rush of journalists going to West Berlin and setting up the cameras and setting up the lights, and and it became. People were on the wall. They were dancing on the wall, and someone started taking a sledgehammer to it. It was a hated symbol, and they wanted it down. Um, and it was it was an amazing it was an amazing time. Within a few weeks of that, you'll see the Velvet Revolution, uh, where Czechoslovakia, the people get out in uh, Václavské náměstí in, in Wenceslas Square. And they stand, quarter of a million of them, holding their keys and ringing them and asking asking for the leadership to step down, which they eventually do. In Hungary, you have something of the same movement. Uh, and here's the thing. Gorbachev, at any moment of time, excuse me, Gorbachev at any moment of time could have brought in the tanks and he did not. And I think 
when you see it from that aspect, yes, it was the people power. Yes, it was the bottom up. But Gorbachev could have stopped it. One man, one man. He had the power to stop it, and he did not. David Hasselhoff's role in the fall of the Berlin Wall. John, you still there? Aha. <laughs> I see John's mic is on mute. So. Ha, right, I because uh, my, my, phone, <laughs> my phone started going off because I yeah. looked something up and I didn't realize it was going to uh, all of a sudden uh, mm -hmm. start talking at me instead right. of just going, I, going yeah. to the search results. But uh, <laughs> uh, because when you were talking about all that and the wall coming down, um, for some reason, uh, the name David Hasselhoff came into my head. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so, of course, the Germans are mad about David Hasselhoff. I mean, they just think he's the greatest thing. And, and I, I'm not sure why that is. But uh, Well, he was a very popular singer in West Germany. He becomes popular in East Germany. <clears throat> and he's one of the few first Americans who goes over there because he knows he has a large fan base over there. So he gets over there. Here's one of the things that um, is kind of weird about the moment. America didn't do anything. We sent journalists. We covered it like crazy. I remember watching it uh, on TV and just crying. Um, and especially about the Velvet Revolution, um, to see to see all this happen, and uh, how amazing it was. Um, but it was also right after the Loma Prieta earthquake, and I lived just 180 miles north of San Francisco, so that was craziness too. And it was at, uh, at the same time. Anyway, but uh, George H. W. Bush did nothing. He, he was very guarded in what he said. He said very little. Uh, and he was willing to take a wait and see. And he took a big risk because there could have been uh, the power vacuum formed by the, the old guard leaving. Uh, but it didn't quite happen that way. Margaret Thatcher, the Iron Lady, was uh, Prime Minister of, um, of England. She was afraid of the wall coming down. She was afraid that uh, ending the division between East Germany and West Germany would all, all of a sudden create a strong Germany. She was totally against unification. She didn't want to see it happen. <laughs> so, so looking back... Um, and looking at the primary sources and looking what people were actually saying, it was it was a very unique time, but it wasn't universally everyone going crazy and being happy. There were people who were who were um, somewhat bothered by it. And was Prime Minister Thatcher? I mean, was she worried that the reunification of Germany would uh, allow Nazism to rise again, or? Yes. She, she still had the bad feeling from World War II uh, when, you know, Germany after World War I, Germany after World War, uh, World War I became the single Germany. It became a powerhouse uh, under the NSDAP. And so consequently, it was a strong Germany. Part of the reason to divide up Germany was to keep it from becoming a technological and military powerhouse. It became a te technological powerhouse after World War II, mainly because of the Marshall Plan. Uh, in West Germany, we poured $8 billion into Europe to rebuild factories. And when you rebuild factories uh, after the war, they were getting brand new equipment. The factories were up to date. The supply chain was improved. Um, Germany was a very high tech place after after that point. Whereas in Great Britain, they were still working with the uh, factories 
that had been around since the the 1880s, 1890s, 1900s, out of date. Um, that was one of the things that bothered um, Margaret Thatcher. So uh, two questions. One, um, at the time, uh, so was uh, George Bush uh, called out uh, in the media or in general um, for his, uh, basically his silence on it. And, you know, the idea that here a celebrity, David Hasselhoff had gone over there. And uh, secondly, uh, you know, two years hence, uh, you know, from when uh, Reagan said, tear down that wall, uh, what did he have to say about it? Or did he have anything to say about it at the time? I don't, I don't recall that he had much to say about it. He was really in a decline after that. Uh, he wasn't, it was almost as if uh, the journalists didn't really seek him out. He made, he made a few speeches in Japan, um, but he kind of faded away into the sunset. Yeah, he yeah. Didn't, he, he didn't die for another couple of years, but I think the Alzheimer's was to the point of um, it was no longer. He, he didn't want to be seen, and the people who supported him didn't want him to be seen that way. To tarnish, to tarn yeah. and, and tarnish his legacy by yeah. not seeming to be all there, yeah. yeah. Um, and, and, and then as far as H.W. Uh, Bush, um, did, did he take heat for not, you know, being more vocal about it? And oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, the Democratic Party was extremely upset that he wasn't doing anything, as far as I remember. But he was affected by Tiananmen Square. I think his his hesitation was that he did not want this um, want this to be another Tiananmen Square. He didn't know, <laughs> you know. He's right in the middle of this. He's reading. He's reading. He's reading better reports than we certainly were. Um, the the general public. Uh, if you go to the CHNM website on the making of the history of 1989, you'll see some of the presidential briefings. Uh, the morning presidential briefings in which it some of this stuff comes as a complete surprise. So he was uh, leery of the whole thing, much like Margaret Thatcher was then. I don't think he was quite so leery. I think I think he was uh, more frightened for the people. He did not want to see violence visited on the people. He was old enough, if you recall, to remember uh, Hungary in 1956. Uh, the moment that Hungary decided that they wanted to become neutral, like Austria. It was 1956, and that starts with protests and then becomes a bloodbath. Uh, the fighting in, in Budapest, the fighting for several days in Hungary was absolutely appalling. Um, people had broken into the National Guard units. They had gotten guns. Um, they had physically gone into the, uh, I don't remember the name of the Hungarian secret police, had gone into their secret police headquarters and had pulled secret police agents out of the building and tied them by their ankles to trees and beat them to death with their fists and kicked them to death. Right across the street from that building was the Soviet embassy. And there was the ambassador to Hungary was on the phone to Moscow saying, you've got to bring in the tanks. They're crazy. That ambassador was Yuri Andropov. Oh, wow. And Yuri Andropov would become the head of KGB, and he would be the head of KGB during the 1968 Prague Spring when they did bring the tanks in. Now, one of the leaders of the reform movement in Czechoslovakia of 1986 uh, was a man named, um, oh, oh, isn't that terrible? I've read his books and I have blanked on his name. I'll remember his name. Anyway, yeah. this man uh, was part of the reform movement, Mlinarz. His name was Zdenjak Mlinarz. And he uh, was in the 1950s and during the 56 uh, rebellion in Hungary, he was in Moscow studying law. 
and he had a special, he had a roommate. He had a, a, a roommate from Russia. They were the same age, they studied laws together, and they remained best friends until Mlynarz's death. And that roommate was Mikhail Gorbachev. <laughs> they shared what had happened in 68. They shared an understanding of what had happened in 56, and they shared an understanding on how badly the Soviet Union looked bringing those tanks in in 68 uh, with the unarmed people during the Prague Spring. And Gorbachev had visited Prague shortly after uh, when the period they called normalization started. Um, and he saw how angry the Czechs and Slovaks had become at the, at the Russians, the Soviet Union. And they had been one of the closest allies of the Soviet Union. There were banners uh, all over uh, Czechoslovakia uh, that said the Soviet Union and Czechoslovakia together forever uh, during the during the uh, the 1968 somebody had gone up to the banners and and painted you know the Soviet Union and Czechoslovakia together forever but not a moment longer. <laughs> <laughs> I um, clap jokes. Um, it sounds like me. a it almost sounds like a uh, Yogi Berraism. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but definitely, Gor Gorbachev, when he tried to put Glasnost into place and Perestroika, these two movements were supposed to be economic reforms, which the Soviet Union desperately needed at the time in the 80s, and um, election reforms. And the, 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 it might have done okay, except for the fact that even though they're talking perestroika and glasnost, the Soviet Union is still got it, uh, tied down in Afghanistan, and the Soviet Union had lied uh, about the Chernobyl disaster. They did not release information about it for six days. Uh, there was the recent um, um, HBO miniseries about Chernobyl. I, I want to see it badly. I don't have I don't have HBO. Um, so it it uh, the 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 feeling that Gorbachev was saying good stuff but he was not doing what he said he would, um, was very strong. He is still persona non grata in Russia. They hated, one of the most hated men in, in, um, Soviet, uh, in Russia. I think, I think Stalin uh, scores higher than Gorbachev. <laughs> I, oh, I, wow. I, no, I'm not sure. I, would, I don't know the exact. Um, uh, so... Definitely, um, I, I think this is a very long answer to a single question, but I think Gorbachev's role cannot be underestimated in this. And um, just real quick, uh, I see Puff Lopagus in the live chat. Uh, my hey, Puff. Yeah, my apologies, Puff. Um, I, I did forget to mention that. It's in my notes. I was going to mention that at the top of the show, and I'm glad you, you uh, showed up here and uh, reminded me of that because uh, I forgot to do it. Um, you know, uh, as Puff uh, posted in the live chat there uh, two weeks ago, his father passed, and he has a GoFundMe, which he also linked in the live chat, um, and which I will put in the video description. Um, please go over there and help him out. Uh, this is something that happened suddenly, and his family is having a tough time paying for the funeral. Um, and as well, you know, go over there and help with what you can. But also, please share this link on social media. Um, that can help in a really big way. It can exponentially grow your uh, your donation, you know, by sharing it on social media. Um, and welcome, Puff. Uh, you know, uh, before we move on. Uh, you know, you mentioned a couple times the, uh, Tiananmen, the Tiananmen Square incident, and uh, you know that's that's one image that the the video of you know that guy 
you know, blocking the the uh, path of the um, of the tank always gets me. Um, and uh, this has nothing to do with tonight's topic, but I was just wondering if you knew uh, whatever became of that guy. I don't know. Yeah, I just I, I, I never thought of that before. I imagine he was dealt with harshly. <laughs> I don't know. Unless he just melted into the crowd. That could be too, yeah. Um, he, was, he was coming home from shopping. Right, right. He had bad he groceries in his hand, yeah. He was yeah. a man coming home from shopping. Um, there was an uh, incident just like that in Prague in 1968 when the Soviet tanks rolled in, a uh, gentleman who had been in one of the concentration camps, Treblinka, I believe it was, went home, put on his old concentration camp uh, outfit, the pajamas, the striped pajamas, and stood in front of the tanks. Um, um, he was kind of a, a sad case. He committed suicide shortly after, uh, but he wanted to to point out how badly the Soviet Union was was treating Czechoslovakia, just like the the Nazis had in 1938. Anyway, that's long long story. Is there pictures? Is there pictures of that? As oh yeah. Well? Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, I've got it. Um, I've got it somewhere on my shelf, but I don't know exactly where. Well, that's fine. Yeah. We'll, I, I, it would take me too long to look it up. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, people can look that up if they want to. That's something I wasn't aware of until until you just told me. Um, so, uh, all right. So the wall comes down in 1989. Mm -hmm. um, you know, let's talk about you know what has happened you know, since then and what effects it had, um, you know, on Germany, as we all know, I mean, Germany is, is a big, big player on the international scene now, a part of, uh, you know, the G20 and the G, they're part of the G8 as well, aren't they? Yeah. Uh, yeah. they G7. They're G7 now. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Got rid of Russia. Um, something about the Crimea, the, uh, it was a very difficult thing to put those two countries together. Uh, the East Germans had a very different work ethic. The West Germans had a very strong work ethic. The East Germans had a different type of work, work ethic. Um, in many of the cities in East Germany that had been bombed, and I'm not talking about Berlin, I'm talking about towns like Zwickau, and Dresden, the East Germans did not rebuild certain buildings. They left them as rubble to make sure the population could see the effects of the Allied bombing. Because it was, it was the American bombers and the British bombers that did all the, the damage in Dresden. Uh, I think that city more than any else would be, um, would be an emblem of what's happened in Germany now. Uh, if you know the story, Dresden in World War II was firebombed uh, and it started a tornado, a fire tornado. Uh, and it probably killed a quarter of a million people. We have no idea, mainly civilians, uh, because Dresden had been an important rail crossing. And one of the most uh, beautiful ancient uh, old churches in Europe the, the Frauenkirk in Dresden was never was not rebuilt. Also, the the uh, Zwinger, which was part of um, one of the palaces. I mean, it had gorgeous Baroque palaces and, and medieval Gothic cathedrals and things, and so, and a lot of those were left. And uh, Jerry and I were in Dresden in 1992, so we saw the damage. We saw the buildings that they had left. Uh, damage since World War II, um, but we were also seeing the rebuilding. We were watching, you know, little old guys, stone cutters there creating, recreating these masterpieces. Uh, and now they have rebuilt the Frauenkirk. 
I would not, I don't know if I would recognize Dresden uh, because of how they have fixed it up so beautifully. Um, but it took a lot of work. Um, they had at least the finances were, were in pretty good shape. When you get to Yugoslavia, when it broke up and places like Albania and other places like Romania, the finances were not handled very well. Uh, Albania, in fact, started a pyramid scheme as they were coming from a, from a uh, controlled economy, pardon me, into a more market-faced economy. They had created a pyramid scheme and, and huge numbers of people lost their life savings thinking that they would move up the pyramid and everything. Um, they, but they didn't understand the economics of this. They didn't understand scams. That, that was just not what they did. There was also a huge amount of problem with what do you do with the Stasi and with uh, the Czechs STBs and with the various secret police? Because what happened when the governments folded, the people who were leading the Stasi, the STBs, TB and these other agencies were quick to figure out that something was happening and that they needed to expunge their records. So they pulled their records, took them out in the courtyard of their buildings and burned them. So, so if you were an officer, if you were one of the guys who did all the, the, the uh, uh, torture, if you were part of this secret police establishment, you walked out of the building with a perfectly clean record and a Rolodex. You kept your connections with all of the high level people. So you had a, your Rolodex, but a perfectly clean record. But part of the problem with the secret police was that they had a quota system, that they had to uh, bring in so many people a month. They had to question so many people and they had to turn so many people. Those files they did not touch. And a lot of that reporting was erroneous. A lot of that reporting was for people who had absolute no uh, dealings with the secret police or maybe had answered a phone or something for them once. But these people had permanently stained records. Uh, the, the idea of forgiveness, where do you stop? Um, that became a huge issue. Were we going to have giant trials? Um, uh, East, East German opening up the files of the secret police. Who got to see the files? Could you go in and see your own file? And people went into their own files and looked up and they saw the names of the person who was reporting about them to the secret police. And oftentimes that person doing the reporting was their wife, was their kid, was their husband, was their parent. Um, it was, oh. it was a mess. Uh, so just, just economically it was difficult, but we had bigger issues of justice that they had to figure out. And those, still have lasting repercussions. And so um, how long did it take after the wall came down before uh, you know, reunified Germany, um, you know, became a major player on the international scene? Uh, West Germany had never stopped being a major player. It was bringing the East Germans into the economy and getting them back to a, a uh, better work ethos, getting them back to better equipment, getting them to understand everything. If you ever want to see a very funny film about this time, look up the film Goodbye Lenin. It's, it's adorable. Um, highly recommend it. Uh, the other film on Czechoslovakia and the Velvet Revolution is Kolya. K-O-L-Y-A. Those two films uh, will give you a very good idea about what that change over 
was like, but it was, it was very painful for a lot of people. And now um, is now the time to uh, share the, the information on the website that you uh, were talking about bringing yeah, up? Yeah, let me, let me see if I can share it. Yeah, no, I have to do it. You are, we already have it up. Oh, there you already go. have it up. Yeah. Yep, yep. And this was the web, the website that you referred to earlier, correct? This is the website. Um, let me get to that. Making the history of 1989. Sorry about scrolling. I hope no one got um, seasick on that. <laughs> but very good essays on what happened in each different country. Um, the primary sources full of art and artwork and uh, things happening in different countries. One of the interesting things that you, you saw um, happening at this moment was that uh, many of the satellite countries kept their original flags, but they would put a, a communist emblem, a hammer and sickle in the middle of them. And so all of the, Hungary's flag was like that. Romania's flag was like that. The East German flag was like that. And so all of a sudden you started seeing images of, of flags uh, without, with big holes in them where they had kept the flag, but cut out the, um, cut out the uh, hammer and sickle hammer and sickle. Yeah. But definitely, um, the, uh, the, ah, the Gunter Schabowski press conference, beautiful description. And you can see the transcript of the press conference. Um, so definitely. And if you're a, they've got very good interviews with some of the real amazing uh, historians of this period. Also some good teaching modules also uh, very good case studies. So I highly recommend this website if you are interested uh, in it. Well, and, and so many major historical events in that year with lasting repercussions. It's, uh, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't, I, 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 I was aware of, of everything that you uh, brought up, but I was not aware that it all happened in that, in, in that year, you know, yes. um, and so, uh, and we will uh, put a link uh, to that website in the, the video description as well after this post is a video. Um, so uh, next month, mm -hmm. 9th, of no 9th of November, yep. uh, 30th anniversary of the wall coming down. Um, okay. Of course, David Hasselhoff will be there, I'm sure. Uh, I hope so. <laughs> I uh, hope so. But with such a, uh, you know, momentous uh anniversary now now have there been celebrations on, on on other anniversaries is there a celebration every year uh that there's a, there was a really big celebration uh at the 25th anniversary i don't know what's planned coming up i um i've been out of the loop so i haven't heard if there's something in fact planned uh i certainly hope there is i remember um when Germany was unified. I don't know if you remember this. Um, the, I, 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 keep, I keep getting um, choked up when I think about it. Uh, I Brandenburg Gates. Oh, you okay? <laughs> well, I don't, all of a sudden when I stopped screen sharing, um, my, uh, my avatar was in the uh, upper uh, corner of my box, but I was back on camera. But okay. uh, not that I'm not that I'm worried about it too much, but like I said, I don't want to, I don't want to scare anybody off. Yeah. The, uh, at the, the celebration for the unification, uh, they gathered a giant symphony orchestra, uh, and chorus. And at the Brandenburg gates, they had an incredibly huge audience and they played Beethoven's ninth. And that kind of became the, the German, um, anthem for that, uh, the, the, the choral part of it, the ode to joy, in other words. So we, have we got any questions? Is there any, has there been any questions? Uh, I, I, really see, 
a lot of comments and stuff. I haven't really seen any new questions, but yeah, if anybody, uh, okay, here we go. Well, uh, well, that's more of a comment than a question. Um, but uh, yeah, if anybody has any questions uh, for Dr. Misha, um, now is the oh. time to post them. Quisa, um, you, you're asking about the, the flags and the em emblems. Most of the flags uh, are just stripes. They, they didn't have emblems. The, uh, the German flag is just the yellow, red, and black. The Czech flag, since the velvet divorce, is the triangle. And the red, blue, and white. Uh, Hungary has, has one of, I believe, has one version of the flag that's got its old emblem in it. Uh, Romania still retained its uh, striped flag. Romania is the sad case in all of this of 1989. It was the only one that turned violent. Uh, there, the, the leader of, of Romania was a real scumbag and it, it turned into a civil war between the, the military and the secret police and the people. And it was a, it was a lot of people were killed and they captured the uh, leader and his wife, Irifica Ceausescu, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Ceausescu. And uh, they gave him a, a drumhead court and they executed him live on TV so that um, the whole country could see that this monster was gone. But that was the only, that was the only. Um, <laughs> I'm slapping all kinds of, I'm slapping all the wrong buttons here. I don't know if you noticed, I, I dipped out there for a second, uh, ended up leaving the broadcast. At this point, it's safe to say, conclude the fall of the Eastern Bloc was a series of unexpected and unattended events. Yeah. I, I, I don't think anyone envisioned this happening. Um, not like it did, not as peaceful as it was. Uh, and yet a lot of people worked for years to, to bring it, to, to bring these ideas forward. Václav Havel had been, had, had Havel had been in prison many times. Dissidents all over Central and Eastern Europe had written um, endless Samizdat, which is the underground printing uh, or Samizdat recordings. Uh, had been listening to radios all this time from Europe, not just Radio Free Europe or Voice of America. Those were blocked for the most part. They were listening to Radio Luxembourg, uh, which was one of the few commercial stations in Europe. And it had a huge reach and played rock and roll in multiple languages. And that was, uh, that was the station everybody loved to listen to, but no, it wasn't, it wasn't one group. It was, it was different in each place. And, and, you know, I, I think the gas had just run out of the old guard of Egon Krantz and, and the leadership in, in Czechoslovakia and Ceausescu in Romania, they were ancient. All of them were old, well, except for Egon Krantz. He's still alive and still feels that that was one of the worst nights of his life when the wall fell. Um. Yeah. And uh, thank you so much. Uh, I, I always butcher your, I don't, I don't know if it's Quisa or Quiasa. Um, uh, I know Steve appreciates your super chat and uh, um, we appreciate you coming around for many, many of these broadcasts. Um, just want to say hi to uh, Les Nagy. Sorry, I'm not really posting in the chat, but I see your, your greeting to me. I appreciate that. And welcome to Inquisitive Quandary. We got here a little while ago. And once again, you know, welcome to Puffalumpagus. Um, if you are still around, please uh, post your GoFundMe link again. Um, just want to mention again that uh, Puff lost his dad two weeks ago. And um, his family is having a real tough time, you know, paying for the funeral. So, so please, uh, his GoFundMe is uh, in the live chat already. I will get it in the video description um, after this post is a video. Uh, please, uh, you know, 
do what you can to help him out and please share that link on uh on social media um there is another question here uh from napoleon bonaparte uh and uh to what extent was uh I believe he means Khrushchev was the Khrushchev Cuban Missile Crisis, an attempt to force the West to surrender Berlin to the to Soviet control. My understanding of the Cuban Missile Crisis was not it, uh, the Kennedy was not going after Berlin. We had uh, missiles in Turkey. And that was the sticking point for Khrushchev. Uh, that Khrushchev wanted the missiles out of Turkey because I don't believe we had, you know, having, having missiles in Europe, I'm not quite sure how many we had, but I, but I think that was, that was a sticking point between Kennedy and Khrushchev was Kennedy wanted the missiles out of Cuba. Khrushchev wanted the missiles out of Turkey. And here's the thing. Kennedy got Khrushchev to back down and Kennedy backed down as well. We got some of those of those um, missiles out of Turkey from what I understand. However, that was not reported. So it only looked like Khrushchev backed down to the outside world, but it was really Kennedy and Khrushchev both were involved in it and had, had uh, definitely um, negotiate a settlement and another question from uh napoleon oh yeah that was that was a very difficult thing to do um i believe east germany had something like 800 um military red army military uh in place in pl placements in just east germany alone uh, it took them forever to get out of all of those places. Um, that was a huge sticking point. That was one of the real difficult things to do. And of course, we've got Russia's trying to get back into the Donbass, uh, trying to get back into Ukraine. So, yeah, it's kind of hard to get the Russians out, isn't it? Well, maybe maybe we should have had Napoleon on the show. Uh, he's uh... <laughs> yeah, I'm loving the questions. I think they're great. Gorbachev lever reforms the primary cause. Yeah, I I had mentioned earlier his the the glasnost and uh, perestroika. Glasnost was um, transparency in media and uh, had to do with elections. Perestroika was economic moving towards. Uh, market controlled economy. I could have that backwards, but I don't think so. I think Glass knows. I think I've got it right this time. Um, some historians compare it to the camel's nose underneath the tent. Um, you know, some some say, "Oh, it was an inevitable. You just opened it up a little crack, and it was going." down. I mean, you just could not stop these people. Um, I don't, I think what Gorbachev was trying to do was something fairly honorable, but I think it was too little too late. And he was also seen as being duplic duplicitous because of Afghanistan and because of Chernobyl, both of which were um, not showing that even Glasnost had had its limits. There is also one historian out of Harvard who contends that the whole thing fell down because of gas prices. That um, his, his ther thesis is that Reagan kept the gas prices got the, so the, the uh, Saudi Arabians to keep the gas prices so artificially low that uh, gas, gasoline, petroleum, was the one hard, uh, uh, export that the Soviet Union had to gain hard currency. And the prices were so low that 
it was ruining their economy, um, which is the perestroika part. So, so uh, that's another idea that it wasn't. It was the gas prices that helped the fall of the Berlin Wall. But yeah, I think Gorbachev. Any way you look at it, Gorbachev was uh, a major factor in that. And um, this is off topic, but if you sure. want to say, say a few words about this, uh, which mm. sounds like it could be a, a whole stream in and of itself answering that question, but if you just want to say a few quick things about it. Yeah, Mind Onion asked yeah. what caused the relationship between the USSR and USA to go so far south in the first place after World War II. Um, partially very prickly egos between Churchill and Stalin and Truman. Recall FDR had died before the end of the war. So Truman was the president. Truman hated Stalin. Absolutely hated him. Churchill didn't trust Stalin. Uh, part of the problem, one of the reasons why Stalin was so successful in gaining Poland Eastern, Eastern Germany, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, and the other countries was that for most of those countries, democracy had failed them. Democracy and free markets had failed them in that uh, nothing was done when the Munich Pact happened and the Nazis rolled into Czechoslovakia. Nothing was done immediately when Hitler invaded Poland. We finally did something. Um, but there was a there was a real mistrust of the democratic system. Uh, and Stalin had, during the course, entire course of the war, had taken cells of communist leaders from all of these different countries, brought them to Moscow, trained them in Stalinist tactics, and then put them back into place to take leadership roles in the governments once the war was over. And these guys slowly worked their way into leadership positions and took over those countries, essentially from the inside, but with Stalin's, um, Stalin's total uh, acquiescence. He was helping it along. Now, um, I believe you spoke about this uh, earlier, um, but I think you were speaking more of while the wall was up um, and Puffalupicus asks, uh, and, uh, and he's addressing me, uh, but a question is for you for sure. Uh, wasn't there a massive brain drain on the eastern side of the wall uh, after it came down? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, it was. Um, yeah, anyone... Anyone who, who had a degree, anyone who was a doctor, uh, and West Germany, remember this is a surprise. No one had planned for any of this. Um, and they you know, had to set up all sorts of, of rules to bring them in, but I'm not an expert on this, so I don't know exactly what they did. But I, I remember there was anger on both sides about, about what happened. But it was it was fortunate because uh, once the EU was in place, of course, it would it came into into being shortly after this, um, and that uh, allowed for a safety net of people to move all over the place. And all of a sudden, you got jokes about Polish plumbers in Great Britain, and you had you know all of these different people able to move in the entire European Union without having to, you know, get work visas or anything like that. That was another an, another way that that kind of got settled out. Um, and uh, we got another question. And, and uh, do you want me to cut the questions off now? Um, um, you, well, no, as, okay. as long as you want to stay, John, I'm fine. Oh, okay. Um, um, Gorbachev was also afraid to make radical reforms at too quick a pace for fear of angering the old guard, was he not? Oh, absolutely. Um, remember, when, when, um, 
when things actually did fall in the Soviet Union in 1991, the old guard locked themselves up into into one of the buildings and said, we ain't moving. Uh, and that's when Boris Yeltsin called in the tanks and was shooting at the at the building to try to get these people out. Yeah, they were they were not happy, but Gorbachev was party secretary and party secretary has all the power. Um, everyone else kind of worked as a rubber stamp. So it, it was usually just a handful of people at the top of the Politburo who really made things work. And everyone else instigated their plans, but but uh, Gorbachev had a lot of power, but he had a lot of pushback too. And uh, once again, uh, Napoleon, with all those great questions, to what extent was the demonstration of academia um, and intellectualism in the DDR the reason for the brain drain before and after the fall of the wall? Hmm. The, speaking as, as an academician and knowing people who had been uh, scholars under the old system, that was a very difficult system to work under. They were, they were not free to do the kind of research we do now, um, being open to anything. You were, they were told, you can look at this, but you cannot look at this. Uh, so, so just to be able to research freely was a huge deal to these people. Uh, I have a, my, my, one of my heroes uh, was, is a medieval historian in Prague. Brilliant man. And he had run afoul of the, of the uh, communist government. And so he had, was, was teaching and he was running a museum at the time. And so he was very high up in his profession. And he uh, was, ran afoul of the government at one point, and they busted him down to driving a tram. Uh, and he drove a tram all week long. And then when Friday afternoon would come, he would get off of work. He would take his blue, they wore blue jumpers. He'd take his blue jumper off. He'd put on a suit. And then he would go to some conference in England or some conference in France or other places and deliver very important papers. And then he would have to come home and put his jumper back on and drive his train for the rest of the week. So that's a kind that's kind of situation the intellectuals found themselves in. So yeah, who who would want to work in that in that deal? So uh, Puffalubagus asks um, uh, asks if Dr. Mithi, uh, Dr. Griffith can uh, touch on how the international community kept track of former Soviet nuclear weapons engineers and tried to lock them down in the fallout of the wall going down. Did we lock them all down? I don't know. Um, that's another thing I don't know enough about to, to give you a good, strong answer, Puff. I'm sorry about that. But uh, as we saw, there there had been some that had been out and roaming around. I, I think under the Soviet system, however, I don't think the engineers, I think the engineers were kept very siloed. In other words, they knew about their particular parts, but not the whole thing. So you needed more engineers to be able to put together a weapon uh, because they wouldn't know all the steps. They were siloed. But that would, that, that would be an interesting study. I don't think I've got, no, I don't even have any books around that would help you with that one. That's a tough one. So you touched base on uh, this uh, earlier, and uh, Chernobyl occurred in what year? 86. 86. So it was a few 80, years. 84 or 86? So, Help yeah, somebody. Was, I've got to Google. To, to what extent was the Chernobyl accident the catalyst and I, uh, uh, for the uh, unfolding of socialism in the USSR? Um, the effects were were felt more abroad in that 
uh, they started picking up strange readings in uh, Sweden just days after the accident. And uh, Gorbachev had put off telling the world about what actually happened. So we don't know how much fallout had moved, but the you will see a huge growth in the Green Party and their anti-nuclear stance after Chernobyl, of course. Um, and this is going to be part of the uh, the pr protest movement in Leipzig uh, in 1989 will be mothers pushing their baby carriages out and holding candles. And they, they, they usually didn't say much. They just walked the streets with their candles and, and they were anti-nuclear protests. So yeah, Cher Chernobyl was a huge um, catalyst, but for groups outside, the growth of the green of the green movement would take off after Chernobyl. And I th believe the Soviet Union looked to the Green Party as being, you know, a gateway into the politics of the West. So, you know, that, that would be an interesting study. So, um, and thank you again, uh, Kwisa, for uh, the super chat, um, another super chat from you. Um, are there any more holy grails uh, for modern historians, like the cache of Soviet archives after the USSR fell? Um, Hopefully you understand that because I... I, yeah, I oh, yeah, yeah, I, I do perfectly <laughs> because that's a really sad story. That is a tragic story because... Briefly after the USSR fell, everyone said, wow, we're going to get into the archives. Uh, under Putin, the archives are, most of them are inaccessible. Uh, there was a big movement to memorialize the gulag. Uh, they had websites. They had a museum. They had other publishing. They had... Um, all sorts of, of uh, documents. Most of those have been closed down. One of the um, important archives that I worked at in Hungary, in the um, Open Society University, which was in Hungary. It was an awesome place to work. Orban, the current leader of Hungary, has closed it down cut off to the Central European University, and it had to move. These, the guarantee of getting in these archives, there's no guarantee. Um, and as I said, it's a, it's a truly tragic sort of thing that happened. Not that the, the Russians were that good at their archives to begin with. My mentor at Chico State, Kate Tranchell, uh, was doing research on Peter the Great's uh, European tour. She was going through all of the, the account books because Peter the Great, this is in the uh, early 18th century, uh, traveled through Europe, supposedly incognito, but kind of people, everyone knew he, who he was because he was over six foot tall and spoke with a decided Russian accent, uh, although he could speak French as well. Anyway, um, so he bought a lot of stuff and had it sent back. Uh, to Russia, and there were expense books on the, the vast amount of money that he, he spent. And that was, she was assigned, my mentor was assigned to look at these expense books and get information. And they were housed in Leningrad. And she uh, couldn't find an archive. She knew that book had existed at one point, and she couldn't find it and couldn't find it and couldn't find it. She finally uh, she said in tears, went to the head archivist and said, where is this volume? I'm missing these volumes. And he said, well, during World War II, it was very cold in Leningrad. Oh. And we didn't have firewood. Oh, and his father had been the head archivist at this archive in Leningrad. And his father made him memorize the uh, books that they literally burned so that they could stay alive. 
and and books she needed was was some of that um, collection. Talk about Fahrenheit four fifty one, huh? Yeah. Um, and uh, thank you again, Quisa. Uh, and we have uh, from Clifford Reynolds, uh, Doctor Griffith. What uh, what did Gorbachev? Uh, what or what does Gorbachev think of the fall of the USSR? Does he regard it as his greatest failure? I've I've read that he does. Um, I've read that he does. I I think, as I said, I think he had he had somewhat honorable um, intentions, but it all went went cattywampus. And as I say now, he is he is persona non grata in Russia. Um, Putin has announced that the worst day in the history of Russia was the day that that the Soviet Union fell. And so, well, and so so Gorbachev's still alive then. Oh yeah. Where does he oh, yeah. where does he where does he reside? I think he's in Paris. Oh okay. I think I can't I can't guarantee. And uh, thank you, Napoleon. He posts in the chat that uh, Chernobyl occurred on April 26th, uh, 1986. I got it. <laughs> that yeah. weird. Not bad. Um, yeah, you had it right the first time and, and questioned yourself and said another year after that <laughs> that it could have been. Um, now let's see here. This is from YouTube Surgeon General. Welcome. Um didn't a part of India get completely wrecked because of that? He says, "I'm not." Do you know the that that he is referring to? Nope. Sorry about that. If you can uh, post a clarification to what that is, YouTube Surgeon General, we can come back to this. Um, let's see here. Any other questions? Uh, da 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 da. Not seeing anything here so far, but I'm quite a bit far back. Let's see. Oh, Napoleon, you are just such an inquisitive human being. Uh, I, wish, you... I wish I had Napoleon in my classes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's uh, uh, asked a lot of good questions. Um, would it be accurate to say that from a Marxist uh, lens, the USSR collapsed due to its own internal contradictions more than any external cause? Mm. You're having you're having me put on my Marxist hat. Oh dear. Um, well, I, I, internal contradictions, sure, because uh, because the 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 idea of being self-critical, but uh, you know. I, I do not feel that what had developed in the Soviet Union, starting with Lenin in 1918, was something that Marx would have liked. Uh, Marx himself was warned against uh, trying to establish communism in some place backwards like Russia. And I believe he did say Russia as the example of where not to start it. Marx believed it was going to happen either in England um, or in Germany, but certainly not in Russia. That's why they had to impose dictatorship of the proletariat, da 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 da, you know, and the vanguard of the of the revolutionaries. But um, you know, I, to, to 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 me, what what occurred in the Soviet Union was so. Uh, cobbled together and so much uh, an authoritarian dictatorship that became cultural, uh, that, that the bureaucrats became bureaucrats, not because they wanted to become bureaucrats, but it was a system that valued party membership, not um, honoring merit, loyalty to party, was more influential in getting you where you needed to go uh, or where you wanted to go than through actual merit and, and your actual work. So definitely, um, it's not very Marxist at all. There, you know, I, I believe myself that there was a chance with the Prague Spring of 1968 to get closer to what Marx wanted, but 
communist Czechoslovakia was a very advanced technological nation. It was the exact kind of nation that Marx said communism would happen in. Um, but it, you know, it needed to move into that, into that idea of democratic elections, et cetera, before they got there. And uh, what YouTube Surgeon General is referring to um, is that he is, uh, um, he, he says he remembers watching a documentary about a few places in India getting devastated over Chernobyl. Um, just wanted to, wanted to know if the doctor could expand on that or if, if that's something that you're aware of. Are you thinking about the chemical e plant explosion? Because Chernobyl is in Belarus. It's it's near Ukraine. It's it's closer to the Polish border than anywhere near Indian. Uh, there was the Bhopal disaster in the early 1980s that in India that. Um, killed like 3,000 people when a chemical plant exploded. I don't, I remember it as a younger person, but it was, um, that was really scary. But it, I don't believe Chernobyl had anything to do with, with India. Yeah, it's quite a, dis it's quite a distance yeah. away from India. Um, and, uh, and, the, and the prevailing winds were taking things to the northwest. So that's in the exact opposite direction of India. So I'm going to call this the last question, folks, uh, because uh, we've been at this for a little over an hour and a half. Um, I know uh, Dr. Misha told me beforehand she has some papers to grade, and uh, <laughs> I, I have some things I have to get to as well. Um, uh, Dr. Misha, how much did a America's imposition – that we and our allies worked to isolate the USSR in a way that we did not do with China post World War II affect their failure. Mm. Um, China is a weird case because it was our ally during World War II and we funneled huge amounts of funds into the Nationalist Party, Sun Yat Sen's party uh, during the war and it um, boy I, it's been ages since I've re read my Chinese history but uh, soon after the war China had its its own civil war and that's when Mao won that's why just two weeks this last week uh, China celebrated its 70th anniversary uh, because this is the anniversary of the of the war, which would m make it what 1949. But once Mao's in place, China's cut off from the West totally, in a way that even the Soviet Union was not. China was far more closed off than the Soviet Union, um, in in ways that just boggle my imagination now. Um, but having to isolate, uh, uh, the USSR, Stalin, Stalin worked towards isolation from, uh, the moment he took office in the late 1920s. Uh, he was, he believed in autocracy, uh, A U T A C R. Uh, anyway. It's not an autocratic system, it's autocracy, which meant that he wanted to have the Soviet Union self-contained and self-reliant and not have to import anything, not have to be dependent on anyone. So uh, Stalin was the one that imported um, that closed society, not not really us. Uh, we will would do it. Um, in the 40s and 50s, but it, you know, I, I think the character of the Soviet Union was more closed off uh, than we were closing them off. 
But that's that's my opinion, unfortunately. Um, you would find other people arguing with me a lot about that. And uh, Napoleon had asked in the, uh, in the chat if he could use the website you shared with us to source his papers. I can answer that myself. You absolutely can, as long as you footnote it and include the uh, attribution in the bibliography of your paper. You can right. you can source your information from anywhere as long as you give attribution. Um, so uh, once again, uh, I noticed Puff had put his uh, GoFundMe um, in the live chat. Just want to mention to anybody that's joined us, um, you know, uh, as of late, um, Puff lost his father two weeks ago. And the GoFundMe is to help him and his family, uh, you know, pay for the funeral. Uh, it happened suddenly, and it's uh, uh, turned into a hardship uh, for them to come up with the money for burial. Um, please, uh, you know, go over there to the GoFundMe. I'll put it in uh, a link in the uh, video description. Um, and uh, also, if, if uh, Dr. Misha will DM me uh, the link to that website, I'll, I'll put that in the video description as well. Um, but yeah, go over and please, please uh, help Puffle up, I guess, with what you can. And please share that link on social media uh, and put the word out for him. Um, so, uh, I guess we're gonna we are going to call it a night. Uh, it turned out very well. Uh, just having Dr. Misha here. Uh, if if we get Dr. Misha on on a topic she's familiar with, uh, she, can, she can she can pretty much carry the broadcast herself. Uh, as you see, um, and uh, I appreciate her being here. I love having her on. Um, well, so I loved I loved having our live chat there. Uh, their questions were terrific, um, and it's so nice to have people out there. Thank you so much, all of you in the live chat. It was delightful to see you there. And uh, so uh, why don't you take a minute and tell folks where they can find you? Oh, um, my husband Jerry and I have a channel called History Unsettled. Uh, we have not been churning out very much product Lately, uh, we had originally intended to have it weekly, but uh, my schedule and his schedule won't allow that. So uh, we're working on uh, doing a, a series on Rome, and we're hoping to talk to John later in October. Oh, yes, later in October. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and that will take... Uh, uh, take place on this channel as well. Yes. 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 Um, and, uh, we are going to, uh, should I tell them specifically? Yeah, go for uh, it. Okay. So, uh, we want to have a, uh, periodic, uh, stream where we, uh, read, uh, literature about uh, beforehand about uh, monsters and about uh, you know uh, we, we could branch out from monsters right 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 I mean but like 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 I would say literature uh, fictional literature with historical context and then talk mm -hmm. about get get put a panel together and talk about it later uh, and so the first thing we are going to do and I I have to admit I didn't finish it yet because I was in the midst of reading it and then my uh, subscription or uh, my the, the term of my borrowing of it on the from the e library ran oh. out and took it back so I got I've got to uh, reorder it again and finish it but we're going to talk about uh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein Frankenstein um, and it's a, uh, it's a it's a book I teach to my uh, second semester classes when we talk about uh, the scientific revolution and the age of enlightenment and romanticism and the French Revolution and the Industrial Revolution it is a fantastic book for that uh, do not cheat and watch the movies because it won't work. <laughs> I'm watching. Any of you mentioned tall green guys with bolts in the neck? You're out of here. Um, no, I won't kick you out. <laughs> Grade your paper down a lot. Uh, but definitely, if you want to, you know, if we can uh, uh, get people to show up having read the book or if they're at all interested in it, and I will be giving a lot of background because Mary Shelley is one of the most fascinating people 
in European history. So is her mom. Um, but that's for that evening. And so uh, look for that. I would imagine the Saturday before Halloween. Um, Probably and, something uh, like that. Yeah. Yeah. Something like that. We'll, we'll work the details out. Um, and just so you folks know, like I have this app on my phone, it's called overdrive and you can get th this app from the app store and then you link it to your uh, uh, library uh, membership. And then if your library has any books you want to borrow as ebooks, you don't even have to go to the library. You just go into Overdrive and you click on the link to go to your library. You borrow the ebook, it's downloaded onto your device, and you have it, you know, just like if you borrowed a, a book, you would have it for two weeks or three weeks, whatever the term is at your library. Um, and uh, if, in case other people aren't aware of this also, uh, any public library in the country also has uh, sh uh, uh, library sharing, you know, so if you your local library doesn't have it, they can reach out to any library in the state you live in. And if they crap out reaching out to those libraries, uh, most libraries can reach out to any library in the country and uh, get what you're looking for. So um, myself, uh, you can look for me on A Raging Atheist on Wednesday night, uh, this week and in the future. Um, you can find me back here next Saturday night. Um, not sure what we'll be talking about uh, yet, but uh, maybe we'll be doing the Frankenstein thing. I don't know, but uh, get that book and read it and uh, um you know, come back for those festivities when they occur. Um, my channel, uh, the Amateur Conversationalist, uh, you know, give that a look and and uh, give me a sub if you're so inclined. There's uh, six interviews over one-on-one -on -one interviews over there thus far from people in the YouTube community. There will not be an episode tomorrow, but I will get back on the stick with one uh, a week from tomorrow. Um, thank you so much to everybody that uh, showed up here tonight. Thank, thank you, absolutely. To Dr. Um, and uh, I uh, oftentimes try and close uh, stream out uh, with a quote. Um, and this quote uh, was, is uh, in the East Side Gallery in Berlin. Um, and it was uh, posted over there in 1990, shortly after the wall came down. I'm not going to try and read it in German. Um, but the translation is, many small people who in many small places do many small things can alter the face of the world. Good night, everybody. Good night.